What does the first Christian Bible say about the shape, position, and motion of the earth? Well, a few simple passages from the pre-Nicene Bible of 144 AD help end a raging controversy or create more questions than it answers. The latest news, history, and analysis from the perspective of the first Christians. Tune into the FBN Worldwide 24-7 radio stream. Stripping away 2,000 years of false doctrine isn't easy, but we've had lots of coffee. Now your host, Darren Kalama. The one thing about viewer mail is that you just never know what's going to come down the pike. We read them all, but some end up breaking new ground for our FBN episodes, and this week was no exception. Let's take a look at what we have here. Hi Darren, I recently had a pretty drawn out discussion with an atheist friend that touched on evolution, the flat earth, and Galileo. I have to admit I was stumped by a couple things, and I'm wondering what the Marcionite Church says about that. I'm a big fan of the show, thanks, Stephen in Maine. Oh, is that all? Why not just bury me neck deep in a pit full of fire ants and call it a day? I mean, that's quite a plate full of topics, so how about we just, I don't know, start off with just one for today. In fact, by dealing with one, we may end up addressing them all. And to do that, I went to the authority on all things pre-Nicene. That would be Bishop Andrew Theophilus at the Marcionite Christian Church. Not only because of the subject matter in your question specifically, but because he usually gives me a 30,000-foot view on tricky subjects. Now, your first question might be, who really cares about the difference between geocentrism and heliocentrism? Why should I care about Galileo and Copernicus saying the Earth revolves around the sun? I mean, I've got bills to pay, and what happens in outer space is for nerds and movie producers. It doesn't affect me. Well, let's see if you feel the same way in about 10 minutes. Now, it's often said that perception is reality, and for the last 500 years, there's been a concerted and well-financed effort by the enemy of mankind, as described by the Apostle Paul in 1 Thessalonians, to remove God from every facet of your life, including and especially removing God from science, literally removing God from the equation and changing your perception of where you stand, not only in this world, but also in the larger universe. It was a mortar attack on the belief in God and the shells came in from all directions and included heliocentrism, that Earth is just one clump of rocks like many others that rotate around the sun in the middle of nothing. Evolution, you started out as a tadpole in a pond surrounded by magic swamp gas. Gravity that makes trillions of gallons of ocean stick to the surface of a tennis ball spinning at a thousand miles per hour but somehow doesn't affect butterflies. And of course the Big Bang where nothing became something even though it was nothing to begin with. Now keep in mind that none of these theories are actually reproducible in a lab. They never have been and never will be. They're the product of a vivid imagination with malign intent. They're simply faith-based theories designed to replace God with man, or, more specifically, replace God with the enemy of all mankind. And I think Copernicus frames it for us rather nicely. Quote, It is not necessary that hypotheses be true or even probable. It is sufficient that they lead to results of calculation which agree with calculation." Unquote. Now remember, a man who doesn't believe in God will believe in anything. But before we get into the why, let's take a look at the how. And let's focus on heliocentrism, because this was the first salvo fired at your belief in God, the first shot across the bow. And from it, all the other lies and magic tricks would flow. This is the pet rock underpinning all the other deceptions. This attack on perception, on God, and by extension on you, began in the 16th century with two men, Copernicus and Galileo, who made their living dabbling in astrology, numerology, tarot cards, and various forms of pseudoscience. These are the terms used in polite society, but 
Their roots are Jewish gematria and Kabbalah magic. Both Copernicus and Galileo attracted wealthy and powerful clients, many of whom held high positions within the Catholic Church. Even two popes were counted as among the benefactors of Galileo, even giving him a beautiful mansion to live in free of charge. You see, back then, astrology was considered to be one of the sciences. In fact, doctors were taught in universities to use astrology to help diagnose illnesses and treat patients. At the time, it was believed that syphilis outbreaks, for example, were controlled by phases of the moon. And mansion or not, it's ironic that Galileo would soon bite the same papal hands that had so graciously fed him. The year was 1542, and Christians around the world slept at night and woke in the morning knowing and believing that they and the unmoving world they lived on was created specially by their Christian God for them. They knew that the sun, the moon, and the stars were also created by their God especially for them, and that these celestial objects moved and rotated around their earth to serve as illumination and give signs, just as Ptolemy, the renowned Greek mathematician and astronomer, had described it in 100 AD. They knew that they were children of God, created in his image, and that he had loved them so much that he sent his only son to let them know it. This was the shared belief among all, and it was backed and encouraged by government leaders and the church. The people were one in their perception of the world and God's guiding hand within it and beyond it, a geocentric, earth-first world created by God for us specifically with God's children at the center of it, confirmed by Plato and Aristotle. Perhaps you've heard of them. Of course, today, after 500 years of atheistic and satanic propaganda, it's hard to imagine such a world, such a people grounded in faith and backed by real science. Today, groundless theories are exalted as science and medicine and used as blunt weapons to destroy faith and disconnect us from God. Fake plagues and DNA mutating bioweapons masquerading as vaccines are venerated, and governments view Christian men as domestic terrorists. You see, Satan's parasites, as described by the Apostle Paul, know that a man without faith is easily fooled and easily controlled. Merely waving a few baubles of the material world in front of him is enough to make him do virtually anything. And with complicit, subverted Christian churches giving it all a wink and a nod, it was a done deal. Demonic control that would have been impossible in the world of 500 years ago. The empty, narcissistic, dystopian, hijacked world of the West you live in today didn't happen overnight. It's 500 years of termite damage. The wood is long gone, and the only thing left is a thin coat of brittle paint covering the void. And it all started with Copernicus in 1543 with his book on the revolutions of the heavenly spheres, which at its core was just a warmed over version of the debunked theory of Aristarchus from 1700 years earlier. Copernicus proved nothing, but as a result of the book was probably able to charge higher prices for his horoscopes and tarot card readings. Ultimately, the church did ban the book after many decades, but the anti-God seed of heliocentrism had already been planted. In 1632, shortly after Copernicus's failure, Galileo, another astrologer, tarot card reader, astronomer, and student of the Kabbalah, living off the largesse of two different popes, then published his book, entitled the dialogue concerning the two chief world systems, in which he compared the Copernican system with the Ptolemaic system. Eventually, Galileo's heliocentric theory was accepted by the church after a period of virtue signaling and committee meetings. But why? Why would the Catholic Church abdicate its position that the earth was special, the center of the universe of which all else revolved? Was Galileo's version of heliocentrism so fantastically different from Copernicus? So jarringly different that 
the church would say, oh, wow, we were so wrong. Look at this treasure trove of knowledge unearthed by Galileo. It's all so stunningly obvious now. All this new proof is just irrefutable. We must cast God aside and stop believing our own eyes now. Well, the answer is no. Galileo brought no new proofs to the table, just some minor tweaks to the 1800-year-old heliocentric theory dreamed up by Aristarchus, the same warmed-over plate of nothing promoted by Copernicus. But something clearly happened. Something changed. Some new argument or angle must have been introduced to cause the fracture in faith and a break with over 1,600 years of deeply held Christian beliefs. What was it? Well, as we so often say, the corrupt tree does not bear good fruit. And at the root of the church's problems, we see once again their mistake of stapling two different religions onto one Bible. Ultimately, the church changed its entire view of the world and universe based on a passage from the Hebrew Bible, the Torah. It was renamed to the Old Testament in the second century. Suddenly, the core of Christian belief now hinged on a passage from the Hebrew Bible of an alien religion. It's in Joshua, chapter 10, verses 12 through 14, and it says, Then spake Joshua to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up to the Amorites before the children of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, Son, stand thou still upon Gibeon, and thou moon in the valley of Ajalon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stayed, until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. Is not this written in the book of Jasher? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven, and hastened not to go down about a whole day." Unquote. And with this, the church said to Galileo, you know, so you see, we can't accept the earth revolves around the sun because it would mean this scripture is untrue. And this looked like it ended the debate. I mean, after all, Galileo couldn't claim that he was more right than the Hebrew Bible. This was a tough spot for our favorite astrologer, and it looks like a dead end. Now, I want to pause right here and remind you that the church is now relying on a passage from an alien religion as its final backstop, its final defense against heliocentrism. And can you guess what happened? Well, that's right. Galileo sliced through that theological defense like a hot knife through butter. He obviously talked to somebody very skilled in Torah interpretation to come up with his answer. Now, Bishop Theophilus of the Marcionite Christian Church says it's likely that one of his Jewish Kabbalah acquaintances helped him over this hurdle. And before I tell you what he said, I want to remind you that this Joshua passage talks about the deity worshipped by Jews that stops the sun just so they can more effectively slaughter their enemies. Make no mistake, it's not the same Christian God as revealed to us only by Jesus Christ. Now, with that said, here's the explanation that upended 1,600 years of Christian belief and doctrine. Fasten your seatbelts, here it comes. Quote, Therefore, given that the sun is both the source of light and the origin of motion, and given that God wanted the whole world system to remain motionless for several hours as a result of Joshua's order, it was sufficient to stop the sun, and then its immobility stopped all the other turnings, so that the earth, as well as the moon and the sun, and all the other planets, remained in the same arrangement. And during that whole time, the night did not approach, and the day miraculously got longer. In this manner, by stopping the sun, and without changing or upsetting at all the way the other stars appear or their mutual arrangement, the day on the earth could have been lengthened in perfect accord with the literal meaning of the sacred text, unquote. And that's it. Voila! Abracadabra! Galileo simply baffled them with bull. So amazing was his explanation that apparently nobody bothered to point out that a separate command was given to stop the moon over Ajalon, meaning it wasn't sufficient to stop only the sun to render the universe immobile. But 
Maybe they didn't drink enough coffee back in the 1600s. Who knows? But be that as it may, let's tinker with this a little bit, just for the sake of argument. Let's get the lay of the land on what this passage would have looked like from space. Let's see here now. The sun is over Gibeon when it is ordered to stay, and the moon is west of it over the Ajalon Valley. And isn't that interesting? It's exactly what we would expect to find on a stationary Earth with a geocentric model. Yes, real science is amazing, isn't it? And for the atheists that have been genuflecting at the holy altar of their hero Galileo, may I remind you that not only did Galileo use biblical passages to make his case, wrong though he was, he was also a firm believer in the prime mover theory, which is a deistic concept whereby all motion in the universe is initiated by a being or force that is themselves unmoved. So from any perspective, Galileo was batting zero. In 1616, he wrote another book, Discourse on the Tides, while in Rome and appealing for papal acceptance of the teaching of Copernican theory. But instead of relying on Kabbalah wizards to explain the universe as he did for the Joshua passage, Galileo let it all hang out with a solo effort that said the sun caused ocean tides. Of course, if this theory were correct, there would be only one high tide per day, and it was laughingly dismissed by actual scientists. But despite this, Galileo continued to argue in favor of his theory of tides, considering it the ultimate proof of Earth's motion. Historical writer E.J. Eitan states that the discourse is, quote, among the least successful of Galileo's investigations and completely misrepresents the phenomena it is supposed to explain, unquote. In other items of note, Galileo fathered three children out of wedlock despite claiming to be a devout Catholic, and he also went completely blind in the year 1638. If Galileo's goal was to subvert Christianity and remove God and creation from science, he was wildly successful. And fittingly, in the Galileo Museum in Florence, Italy, there's a glass vase containing Galileo's severed middle finger of his right hand, extended and positioned vertically. His final message to Christians and real scientists. In closing the book on Galileo, there is one passage from the Bible, the first Christian Bible of 144 AD, that we can apply to him in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 19. And it says, Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? And lastly, the proof of an unmoving earth at the center of the universe of which all else revolves is as simple as looking out your window. But if that isn't enough, countless experiments conducted by real scientists have already proven what you see with your own eyes is the truth. Here's just a few examples, some of the best known. We have Aries' failure of 1871, what was supposed to be the experiment to prove without a shadow of a doubt the Earth was spinning turned into the embarrassment of the century when it actually proved the opposite and showed the Earth does not move at all. It is the stars and planets that revolve around us. In fact, that's how it got its name, Aries failure. The Michelson-Morley experiment, light velocity experiment, which suggests a lack of Earth's motion around the sun. The Sagnac experiment, these were experiments which show that light's velocity is indeed affected by detector motion. The time dilation by latitude, which predicted time dilation caused by the Earth's rotation, does not occur. And even in aviation, mechanical air flight assumes a flat, non-rotating Earth. But the best proof of all is provided by the worshippers of heliocentrism themselves in their very own temples to the sun. We know them as planetariums. And there we find that geared planetary orbital projection within electro-optical planetarium projectors are based on what? Oh, that's right. All based on the geocentric model. Let's wrap it up with 1 Corinthians 15 from the first Bible. 
All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of man, another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, and another of birds. There are also celestial bodies, and bodies terrestrial, but the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For one star differeth from another star in glory. Amen. I hope Stephen in Maine got something from this episode, and that you did as well. Remember, God made you in his image and created the world and universe just for you. Don't let the enemy of all mankind fool you into thinking something else. As a satanic wave sweeps across the world right now, it's extremely important that you're grounded in a firm belief in your relationship with God. And that starts with knowing he made the unmoving earth you live on the center of the universe that he created especially for you. I'm Darren Kalama. Thanks for joining us here at First News on the firstbiblenetwork.com. Kill them all, old and young, girls and women, and little children. Does that sound like something Jesus would ever say to you? The first Christians didn't think so either. And that's why you won't find the Old Testament in the first Christian Bible of 144 AD. Reconnect with your pre-Nicene Christian roots and the Bible you were meant to have. 10 books and the gospel of the Lord. Download your free ebook at theveryfirstbible.org.